Chapter 10. Hitherto I have recorded in detail the events of my insignificant existence. To the first ten years of my life, I have given almost as many chapters. But this is not to be a regular autobiography. I am only bound to invoke memory, where I know her responses will possess some degree of interest. Therefore, I now pass a space of eight years almost in silence. A few lines only are necessary to keep up the links of connection. When the typhus fever had fulfilled its mission of devastation at Lowood, it gradually disappeared from thence, but not till its virulence and the number of its victims had drawn public attention on the school. Inquiry was made into the origin of the scourge, and by degrees various facts came out which excited public indignation in a high degree. The unhealthy nature of the site, the quantity and quality of the children's food, the brackish, fetid water used in its preparation, the pupils' wretched clothing and accommodations, all these things were discovered, and the discovery produced a result mortifying to Mr. Brocklehurst, but beneficial to the institution. Several wealthy and benevolent individuals in the county subscribed largely for the erection of a more convenient building in a better situation. New regulations were made, improvements in diet and clothing introduced. The funds of the school were entrusted to the management of a committee. Mr. Brocklehurst, who, from his wealth and family connections, could not be overlooked, still retained the post of treasurer, but he was aided in the discharge of his duties by gentlemen of rather more enlarged and sympathizing minds. His office of inspector, too, was shared by those who knew how to combine reason with strictness, comfort with economy, compassion with uprightness. The school thus improved, became in time a truly useful and noble institution. I remained an inmate of its walls after its regeneration for eight years, six as pupil and two as teacher, and in both capacities I bear my testimony to its value and importance. During these eight years my life was uniform, but not unhappy, because it was not inactive. I had the means of an excellent education placed within my reach, a fondness for some of my studies, and a desire to excel in all, together with a great delight in pleasing my teachers, especially such as I loved, urged me on. I availed myself fully of the advantages offered me. In time, I rose to be the first girl of the first class. Then I was invested with the office of teacher, which I discharged with zeal for two years, but at the end of that time, I altered. Miss Temple, through all changes, had thus far continued superintendent of the seminary. To her instruction, I owed the best part of my acquirements. Her friendship and society had been my continual solace. She had stood me in the stead of mother, governess, and latterly companion. At this period, she married, removed with her husband, a clergyman, an excellent man, almost worthy of such a wife, to a distant county, and consequently was lost to me. From the day she left, I was no longer the same. With her was gone every settled feeling, every association that had made Lowood in some degree a home to me. I had imbibed from her something of her nature and much of her habits, more harmonious thoughts, what seemed better regulated feelings, had become the inmates of my mind. I had given an allegiance to duty and order. I was quiet. I believed I was content. To the eyes of others, usually even to my own, I appeared a disciplined and subdued character. But destiny in the shape of the Reverend Mr. Naismith came between me and Miss Temple. I saw her in her traveling dress step into a post-chaise shortly after the marriage ceremony. I watched the chaise mount the hill and disappear beyond its brow, and then retire to my own room, and there spent in solitude the greatest part of the half-holiday granted in honor of the occasion. I walked about the chamber most of the time. I imagined myself only to be regretting my loss and thinking how to repair it. But when my reflections were concluded, and I looked up and found that the afternoon was gone and evening far advanced, Another discovery dawned on me, namely, that in the interval I had undergone a transforming process, that my mind had put off all it had borrowed of Miss Temple, or rather that she had taken with her the serene atmosphere I had been breathing in her vicinity, and that now I was left in my natural element and beginning to feel the stirring of old emotions. It did not seem as if a prop were withdrawn, but rather as if a motive were gone. It was not the power to be tranquil which had failed me, but the reason for tranquility was no more. My world had for some years been in Lowood. My experience had been of its rules and systems. Now I remembered that the real world was wide, 
and that a varied field of hopes and fears, of sensations and excitements, awaited those who had courage to go forth into its expanse, to seek real knowledge of life amidst its perils. I went to my window, opened it, and looked out. There were the two wings of the building. There was the garden. There were the skirts of Lowood. There was the hilly horizon. My eye passed all other objects to rest on those most remote, the blue peaks. It was those I longed to surmount. All within their boundary of rock and heath seemed prison ground, exile limits. I traced the white road, winding round the base of one mountain and vanishing in a gorge between two. How I longed to follow it farther. I recalled the time when I had traveled that very road in a coach. I remember descending that hill at twilight. An age seemed to have elapsed since the day which brought me first to Lowood, and I had never quitted it since. My vacations had all been spent at school. Mrs. Reed had never sent for me to Gateshead. Neither she nor any of her family had ever been to visit me. I had had no communication by letter or message with the outer world. School rules, school duties, school habits and notions and voices and faces and phrases and costumes and preferences and antipathies. Such was what I knew of existence. And now I felt that it was not enough. I tired of the routine of eight years and one afternoon. I desired liberty. For liberty I gasped. For liberty I uttered a prayer. It seemed scattered on the wind, then faintly blowing. I abandoned it and framed a humbler supplication for change, stimulus. That petition, too, seemed swept off into vague space. Then I cried, half desperate, grant me at least a new servitude. Here a bell ringing the hour of supper called me downstairs. I was not free to resume the interrupted chain of my reflections till bedtime. Even then, a teacher who occupied the same room with me kept me from the subject to which I longed to recur by a prolonged effusion of small talk. How I wish sleep would silence her. It seemed as if, could I but go back to the idea which had last entered my mind as I stood at the window, some inventive suggestion would rise for my relief. Miss Grice snored at last. She was a heavy Welsh woman. Until now, her habitual nasal strains had never been regarded by me in any other light than as a nuisance. Tonight, I had held the first deep notes with satisfaction. I was debarrassed of interruption. My half-effaced thought instantly revived. A new servitude. There is something in that. I soliloquized. Mentally be it understood, I do not talk aloud. I know there is, because it does not sound too sweet. It is not like such words as liberty, excitement, enjoyment. Delightful sounds truly. But no more than sounds for me, and so hollow and fleeting, that it is mere waste of time to listen to them. But servitude... That must be a matter of fact. Anyone may serve. I have served here eight years. Now all I want is to serve elsewhere. Can I not get so much of my own will? Is not the thing feasible? Yes, yes, the end is not so difficult. If I had only a brain active enough to ferret out the means of attaining it. I sat up in bed by way of arousing this said brain. It was a chilly night. I covered my shoulders with a shawl and then I proceeded to think again with all my might. What do I want? A new place, in a new house, amongst new faces, under new circumstances. I want this because it is of no use wanting anything better. How do people do to get a new place? They apply to friends, I suppose. I have no friends. There are many others who have no friends, who must look about for themselves and be their own helpers. And what is their resource? I could not tell. Nothing answered me. I then ordered my brain to find a response, and quickly it worked and worked faster. I felt the pulses throb in my head and temples, but for nearly an hour it worked in chaos, and no result came of its efforts. Feverish with vain labor, I got up and took a turn in the room, undrew the curtain, noted a star or two, shivered with cold, and again crept to bed. A kind fairy, in my absence, had surely dropped the required suggestion on my pillow, for as I lay down it came quietly and naturally to my mind. Those who want situations advertise. You must advertise in the Shire Herald. How? I know nothing about advertising. Replies rose smooth and prompt now. You must enclose the advertisement and the money to pay for it under a cover directed to the editor of the Herald. You must put it, the first opportunity you have, into the post at Lowton. Answers must be addressed to J.E. at the post office there. You can go and inquire in about a week after you send your letter, if any are come, and act accordingly. This scheme I went over twice, thrice. It was then digested in my mind. 
I had it in a clear, practical form. I felt satisfied and fell asleep. With earliest day I was up, I had my advertisement written, enclosed, and directed before the bell rang to rouse the school. It ran thus. A young lady accustomed to tuition, had I not been a teacher two years, is desirous of meeting with a situation in a private family where the children are under 14. I thought that as I was barely 18, it would not do to undertake the guidance of pupils nearer my own age. She is qualified to teach the usual branches of a good English education, together with French, drawing, and music. In those days, reader, this now narrow catalogue of accomplishments would have been held tolerably comprehensive. Address, J.E. Post Office, Lowton, Shire. This document remained locked in my drawer all day. After tea, I asked leave of the new superintendent to go to Lowton in order to perform some small commissions for myself and one or two of my fellow teachers. Permission was readily granted. I went. It was a walk of two miles, and the evening was wet, but the days were still long. I visited a shop or two, slipped the letter into the post office, and came back through the heavy rain, with streaming garments, but with a relieved heart. The succeeding weeks seemed long. It came to an end at last, however, like all sublunary things, and once more, towards the close of pleasant autumn day, I found myself afoot on the road to Loton. A picturesque track it was, by the way, lying along the side of the beck, and through the sweetest curves of the dale. But that day I thought more of the letters that might or might not be awaiting me at the little burg whither I was bound than of the charms of lee and water. My ostensible errand on this occasion was to get measured for a pair of shoes, so I discharged that business first, and when it was done I stepped across the clean and quiet little street from the shoemakers to the post office. It was kept by an old dame who wore horn spectacles on her nose and black mittens on her hands. Are there any letters for J.E.? I asked. She peered at me over her spectacles, and then she opened a drawer and fumbled among its contents for a long time, so long that my hopes began to falter. At last, having held a document before her glasses for nearly five minutes, she presented it across the counter, accompanying the act by another inquisitive and mistrustful glance. It was for J.E. Is there only one? I demanded. There are no more, said she and I put it in my pocket and turned my face homeward. I could not open it then. Rules obliged me to be back by eight, and it was already half past seven. Various duties awaited me on my arrival. I had to sit with the girls during their hour of study. Then it was my turn to read prayers, to see them to bed. Afterwards, I supped with the other teachers. Even when we finally retired for the night, the inevitable Miss Grice was still my companion. We had only a short end of candle in our candlestick, and I dreaded lest she should talk till it was all burnt out. Fortunately, however, the supper she had eaten produced a soporific effect. She was already snoring before I had finished undressing. There still remained an inch of candle. I now took out my letter. The sill was an initial F. I broke it. The contents were brief. If J.E., who advertised in the Shire Herald of last Thursday, possesses the acquirements mentioned and if she is in a position to give satisfactory references as to character and competency, a situation can be offered her where there is but one pupil, a little girl under 10 years of age, and where the salary is 30 pounds per annum. J.E. is requested to send references, name, address, and all particulars to the direction, Mrs. Fairfax Thornfield, near Millcote, Shire. I examined the document long, the writing was old-fashioned and rather uncertain, like that of an elderly lady. This circumstance was satisfactory. A private fear had haunted me that in thus acting for myself and by my own guidance, I ran the risk of getting into some scrape, and above all things, I wished the result of my endeavors to be respectable, proper, en regle. I now felt that an elderly lady was no bad ingredient in the business I had on hand. Mrs. Fairfax. I saw her in a black gown and widow's cap, frigid, perhaps, but not uncivil, a model of elderly English respectability. Thornfield. That, doubtless, was the name of her house, a neat, orderly spot, I was sure, though I failed in my efforts to conceive a correct plan of the premises. Millcote Shire. I brushed up my recollections of the map of England. Yes, I saw it, both the Shire and the town. Shire was seventy miles nearer London than the remote county where I now resided. That was a recommendation to me. I longed to go where there was life and movement. Millcote was a large manufacturing town on the banks of the A. A busy place enough, doubtless, so much the better. It would be a complete change at last. 
Not that my fancy was much captivated by the idea of long chimneys and clouds of smoke. But, I argued, Thornfield will probably be a good way from the town. Here the socket of the candle dropped and the wick went out. Next day, new steps were to be taken. My plans could no longer be confined to my own breast. I must impart them in order to achieve their success. Having sought and obtained an audience of the superintendent during the noontide recreation, I told her I had a prospect of getting a new situation where the salary would be double what I now received, for at Lowood I only got fifteen pounds per annum, and requested she would break the matter for me to Mr. Brocklehurst or some of the committee and ascertain whether they would permit me to mention them as references. She obligingly consented to act as mediatrix in the matter. The next day she laid the affair before Mr. Brocklehurst, who said that Mrs. Reed must be written to as she was my natural guardian. A note was accordingly addressed to that lady, who returned for answer that I might do as I pleased. She had long relinquished an interference in my affairs. This note went the round of the committee, and at last, after what appeared to me most tedious delay, formal leave was given me to better my condition if I could. And an assurance added that as I had always conducted myself well, both as teacher and pupil at Lowood, a testimonial of character and capacity, signed by the inspectors of that institution, should forthwith be furnished me. This testimonial I accordingly received in about a month, forwarded a copy of it to Mrs. Fairfax, and got that lady's reply, stating that she was satisfied and fixing that day fortnight as the period for my assuming the post of governess in her house. I now busied myself in preparations. The fortnight passed rapidly. I had not a very large wardrobe, though it was adequate to my wants, and the last day sufficed to pack my trunk, the same I had brought with me eight years ago from Gateshead. The box was corded, the card nailed on. In half an hour the carrier was to call for it to take it to Lowton, whither I myself was to repair at an early hour the next morning to meet the coach. I had brushed my black stuff travelling dress, prepared my bonnet, gloves, and muff, sought in all my drawers to see that no article was left behind, and now having nothing more to do, I sat down and tried to rest. I could not, though I had been on foot all day. I could not now repose an instant. I was too much excited. A phase of my life was closing tonight, a new one opening tomorrow, impossible to slumber in the interval. I must watch feverishly while the change was being accomplished. Miss, said a servant, who met me in the lobby where I was wandering like a troubled spirit, a person below wishes to see you. The carrier, no doubt, I thought, and ran downstairs without inquiry. I was passing the back parlor of the teacher's sitting room, the door of which was half open, to the kitchen when someone ran out. It's her, I am sure. I could have told her anywhere, cried the individual who stopped my progress and took my hand. I looked. I saw a woman attired like a well-dressed servant, matronly, yet still young, very good-looking, with black hair and eyes and lively complexion. Well, who is it? she asked in a voice with a smile. I half recognized. You've not quite forgotten me, I think, Miss Jane. In another second, I was embracing and kissing her rapturously. Bessie, Bessie, Bessie! That was all I said, whereat she half laughed, half cried, and we both went into the parlor. By the fire stood a little fellow of three years old in plaid frock and trousers. That is my little boy, said Bessie directly. Then you are married, Bessie. Yes, nearly five years since to Robert Levin, the coachman. And I've a little girl besides Bobby there that I've christened Jane. And you don't live at Gateshead? I live at the lodge. The old porter has left. Well, and how do they all get on? Tell me everything about them, Bessie. But sit down first, and Bobby, come and sit on my knee, will you? But Bobby preferred, sidling over to his mother. You're not grown so very tall, Miss Jane, nor so very stout, continued Mrs. Levin. I dare say they've not kept you too well at school. Miss Reed is the head and shoulders taller than you are, and Miss Georgiana would make two of you in breadth. Georgiana is handsome, I suppose, Bessie. Very. She went up to London last winter with her mamma, and there everybody admired her, and a young lord fell in love with her. But his relations were against the match, and what do you think? He and Miss Georgiana made it up to run away, but they were found out and stopped. It was Miss Reed that found them out. I believe she was envious, and now she and her sister lead a cat and dog life together. They are always quarreling. Well, and what of John Reed? Oh, he is not doing so well as his mamma could wish. He went to college, and he got plucked, I think they call it, 
and then his uncles wanted him to be a barrister and study the law. But he is such a dissipated young man; they would never make much of him. I think. What does he look like? He is very tall. Some people call him a fine-looking young man, but he has such thick lips. And Mrs. Reed, Mrs. looks stout and well enough in the face, but I think she is not quite easy in her mind. Mr. John's conduct does not please her. He spends a great deal of money. Did she send you here, Bessie? No, indeed. But I have long wanted to see you, and when I heard that there had been a letter from you and that you were going to another part of the country, I thought I'd just set off and get a look at you before you are quite out of reach. I am afraid you are disappointed in me, Bessie. I said this, laughing. I perceived that Bessie's glance, though it expressed regard, did no shape denote admiration. No, Miss Jane, not exactly. You are genteel enough. You look like a lady. And it is as much as ever I expected of you. You were no beauty as a child. I smiled at Bessie's frank answer. I felt that it was correct, but I confess I was not quite indifferent to its import. At eighteen, most people wish to please, and the conviction that they have not an exterior like to the second that desire brings anything but gratification. I dare say you are clever, though," continued Bessie by way of solace. "What can you do? Can you play on the piano? A little." There was one in the room. Bessie went and opened it, and then asked me to sit down and give her a tune. I played a waltz or two, and she was charmed. The Miss Reeds could not play as well," said she exultingly. "I always say you would surpass them in learning. And can you draw? That is one of my paintings over the chimney piece. It was a landscape in water colors, of which I had made a present to the superintendent in acknowledgment of her obliging mediation with a committee on my behalf, and which she had framed and glazed." Well, that is beautiful, Miss Jane. It is as fine a picture as any Miss Reed's drawing master could paint, let alone the young ladies themselves, who could not come near it. And have you learnt French? Yes, Bessie, I can both read it and speak it. And you can work on muslin and canvas. I can. Oh, you are quite a lady, Miss Jane. I knew you would be. You will get on whether your relations notice you or not. There was something I wanted to ask you. Have you ever heard anything from your father's kinsfolk, the heirs? Never in my life. Well, you know, Missus always said they were poor and quite despicable, and they may be poor, but I believe they are as much gentry as the Reeds are. For one day, nearly seven years ago, a Mister Eyre came to Gateshead and wanted to see you. Missus said you were at school fifty miles off. He seemed so disappointed, for he could not stay. He was going on a voyage to a foreign country, and the ship was to sail from London in a day or two. He looked quite a gentleman, and I believe he was your father's brother. What foreign country was he going to, Bessie? An island thousands of miles off, where they make wine. The butler did tell me, Madeira. I suggested, Yes, that is it. That is the very word. So he went. Yes, he did not stay many minutes in the house. Missus was very high with him. She called him afterwards a sneaking tradesman. My Robert believes he was a wine merchant. Very likely, I returned, or perhaps clerk or agent to a wine merchant. Bessie and I conversed about old times an hour longer, and then she was obliged to leave me. I saw her again for a few minutes the next morning at Loton, while I was waiting for the coach. We parted finally at the door of the Brocklehurst Arms there. Each went her separate way. She set off for the brow of Lowood Fell to meet the conveyance which was to take her back to Gateshead. I mounted the vehicle which was to bear me to new duties and a new life in the unknown environs of Millcote.